Before I begin, um, the presentations that I've done so far have been as a result of my study into the Greek. And this, I want you to see, is the Greek lexicon that I use. There's many out there, but this is the one I use. They are inexpensive. You can see inside the cover. I paid only $2.62 for this valuable book. Because, and it was from um, eBay, I believe. And uh, it was unused, but I use it quite a bit, actually. One nice thing about it is tied to the Strong's Concordance's numbers. So I can look it up, look up the word in Strong's. I can see what Strong's has to say, but this is far more extensive and will show that while this interpretation of the word applies to these verses, it's this interpretation, this other interpretation, that applies to these other verses. So it gives a lot more information, and I encourage you to use this because if you reach a point where you just are struggling with understanding something, this may make the difference, and you're going to see that in today's presentation also. Um, <clears throat> the title today is, If Divinity Did Not Die, and you recognize those familiar words from Ellen White's writing, humanity died, divinity did not die, and then we enter this hornet's nest of, well, if divinity didn't die, then did Christ really die? And then if he didn't die, then how do we have atonement? And so, you know, you go back and forth and you try to figure this out. And so today we're going to try to answer one of those things in, in the most exciting thing today. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and thank you. Volume. Uh, what? Just the volume. The value, turn up? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. <clears throat> one, one of the things that uh, caused me to go on this search is a book called The Trinity. <laughs> and I wanted to know, okay, these are Andrews University professors. Two at the time were PhDs, and one was working on his PhD. I said, okay, I'm going to see what they say about how we have atonement. And what they did was convince me that they don't know. <laughs> but, uh, um, so here's what they wrote, and I'm reading from their words. Quote, though divinity did not literally die, it as good as died in the following sense. Christ's deity, along with his humanity, sacrificially consented to death. This, they're personifying it. They're making it as if there was this mutual discussion and they both agreed. His humanity agreed and his divinity agreed as if they were persons communicating to each other. So his deity sacrificially consented to death at every step of the way to the cross. Um, and so I continue on a different page. Where is it? Oh. And I also said, why is it that only a member of the Godhead could offer a fully effectual saving sacrifice for sin? I thought, well, that's interesting. That could mean that it would be the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. And then they said that Jesus was chosen. And I'm yeah. quoting, Jesus was chosen. I'm thinking, was there a committee? And who nominated him or who chose him? Didn't he volunteer for this? And so all of this is conflicting with what I used to know. And so I read a little further, and it says, and I read, only one who is fully God could both demonstrate divine love and judge sin capably in all of its horror. Okay? Christ's death did require his deity. Not that his deity literally died. That, that's true, it can't. Immortal life cannot become mortal. But it was there in full unity with his human nature. His deity fully consented to his death, agreed with it. The deity of Christ died a proverbial thousand deaths in the death of his humanity. So it vicariously died, but it didn't really die. And so it says, when we say that God died, and I'm thinking, well, I don't say that, I say that Christ died. 
um, to differentiate between the Father and the Son. Does this refer only to the deity of the Son? And I'm thinking, when we say that God died, does this refer only to his deity? And I'm thinking, well, we didn't even say deity died. And so we continue. When he died, we can truly say that the entire Godhead was in Christ and suffered his atoning death. Okay, and I continue. The deity of Christ is the full deity, deity of the entire triune Godhead. It was a unified self-sacrifice. So, I could not make sense of that. But I couldn't be too critical because I couldn't explain about the deity either. Because if deity can't die, then how do we have atonement? Because if Jesus didn't really die, we don't have atonement. And so we have that particular question. And we also have the other situation. As you already know, there are significant doctrinal differences uh, as to whether or not Jesus is even the truly the Son of God. His divinity is not a question that I'm aware of, but his sonship has been an issue for millennia. In scripture, we know that many acknowledge him to be the Son of God. Mary at Lazarus' tomb, I know that you are the Son of the living God. When Jesus said, who do men say I am and who do ye say I am? Peter answered, you, ye are the son of the living God. Uh, the demons acknowledged him. So, and we have multiple examples. So we know from scripture that he is the son of God. And yet, uh, today it is claimed that Jesus is fully God. And being fully God, God means that there can be no beginning or no end. And therefore, his sonship is not real. <clears throat> He can't be a son because a son is not eternal with his father, is not, a son has a beginning and the father, you know, precedes him. And so we have this questioning of his sonship, actually it's a denial of his sonship, when we have the clear testimony and it hinges on the sonship. So, um, even, even though the Father himself, as uh, Stephen mentioned this morning, these words from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And twice he said that. Um, so, when the word of God is questioned, God himself is questioned because he is the inspiration of it. And when the word of God is questioned and the churches that claim to base their beliefs on the very word of God, then we know that Christianity is in crisis. And there needs to be an understanding. Um, and so the question we're answering today is, if divinity did not die, then how do we have atonement? Did Jesus die? Or did part of him live on? Was only his humanity sufficient for the atonement? We know that is not true because we even have in spirit of prophecy Christ telling the angels, only he, only his death would be sufficient. So, we're trying to make sense of this, and then we're going to start our study. <coughs> I can get it awakened. There we go. First of all, as background, and some of this in the background, bear with me. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Um, I didn't know whether there would be non-Adventists here or not, and so I prepared uh, just from the Bible, and um, we'll go from there. <clears throat> so, um, we affirm or we know that Jesus is fully God. We have Paul saying, Unto the Son, He, God the Father, saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So Jesus is fully divine. There are no degrees of divinity. There is no lesser gods, there is no semi-gods, as they mention in here. Uh, except in Greek or Roman mythology, perhaps. But the apostles John and Peter and Paul make a distinction between the divinity of the Father and the divinity of the Son. Both are fully God. But John wrote, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, the Greek reveals much more than the English translation. In the beginning was the Word, Logos. Whose word, by the way? And Logos was with God. That first God is translated in the Greek, Ton Theon, the God, meaning the Father. And Logos was God. Here, it's adjective. In the first usage, it was a noun. Here it is an adjective. Logos was God, Theos. Notice also in the second sentence. So there is a distinction between the first God, the Father, and the Logos God. One is the Father, the God. And in the second verse, the same Logos was in the beginning with God. Notice, please, the wording that Logos was with God. It wasn't Tontion with Logos. It was Logos being with Tontion. Okay? <clears throat> and so, according to the Apostle John, Jesus is fully divine, but he is not the God. The latter God, the God, is preeminent above all. Now, the apostles Peter and Paul make another distinction. It's that Jesus has a God, something that the Father doesn't. And we see in these two verses, which are identical, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this does not diminish his divinity one particle. Um, so, we have um, John, uh, G even Jesus referred to the Father as both his God and his Father. He said to Mary, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. And then on the cross, my God and my God. And also on the cross, Father. So he refers to the Father himself as his God and his Father. <clears throat> so, um, we're going on to another point. I have to check one of my notes here. We realize that John himself says that Jesus is both fully divine and fully son, but he also records explicitly that Jesus was given life by the Father. And it's so plainly stated, these are actually Jesus's words. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. This is an important verse. He's writing under inspiration. The Father's life, by the way, is the original life. It was not derived from any other source. It was not borrowed from any source. His life is the original life, and that is the life that Christ got. And that's why we say, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, and underived. We need to understand that Jesus is divine because he is the son of a divine being. His divinity is due to his parentage. The two identifiers, divine and son, cannot be separated. He did not have his own divine life in himself. There is no biblical record of that. We read instead that he was given life. Um, there also is no such thing in scripture about any other gods being a source of life, only the Father. And the Father's life is the life that is in Jesus, which we get from Jesus. And this is the record, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, he that has not the Son has not life. So God gives us the life through his Son. Therefore, since Jesus is not independently self-existent, since he did not have his own divine life, but he received it from his Father, we can't deny his sonship any more than we can deny his divinity. He got his divinity by being a son of a divine Father. 
It seems so obvious. Wonder why there's any confusion. Now, the Apostle Paul affirms this point, referring to Jesus as heir, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and Jesus being made so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance. So this is a solid teaching. Okay? Um, and he has a more excellent name. That name, by the way, is that of only begotten son. It is singular to him. No one else can have that title or even that character. But we do have this relationship between the preeminent, precedent father and his begotten son. And the scripture makes it plain, it's not just during the plan of salvation until it ends. The sonship continues for all eternity. And again, we note the sovereignty of the father and the preeminence he has over all beings, including his son. So we have this quote from 1 Corinthians 15. And I put in brackets the, the identifier of the pronouns. For he, the Father, has put all things under his, the Son's, feet. But when he, the Father, saith all things are put under him, meaning the Son, it is manifest, it's obvious or known, that the Father is accepted, which did put all things under the Son. And when all things shall be subdued unto the Son, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto the Father that put all things under him, that God the Father may be all in all. Amen. So we have fully established a relationship between two equally divine beings because there are no degrees of divinity. They're both fully divine. Now, we spent time on that background, which I know is familiar to you, only to point out this regarding Jesus' full divinity and full sonship. Unless Jesus is both truly divine and truly son, we have no atonement. And that's because unless Jesus, unless God's son could truly die for us, not partially, but could truly die for us, again, we have no atonement. And so this study is about his sonship. But before we go further, I'm going to remind you, we do have atonement, which is another evidence that Jesus did die. Except then why are we told that he's only a metaphorical son and only his humanity died? So we're still fighting to clarify that. But we do know, we're assured. So we have this verse in Romans 5. And I also, well, but God commended. He demonstrated or he showed or he proved his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, God died, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, he keeps adding and adding, much more, we will, being reconciled, will be saved by his life. And, on top of that, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Amen. So, again, the scripture makes it clear that Jesus has died, but we have this confusion over how. And I want you to notice in this case also the verb commend, demonstrated or showed or proved. Okay, so we have the evidence that Christ died a satisfactory death, but what is not known is that this death substantiates or validates that Jesus is the Son of God, contrary to what we're being told recently. And the evidence will be shown very shortly. We know that divine life is immortal life. And question, how could Jesus die in our place if he had immortal life? 
How could that part of him die? We know we've been told his humanity died. We know we've been told that his divinity did not die. So some assume that only a human life must have been enough, that Jesus' sinless life could somehow atone and somehow his divinity lived on, but that didn't matter. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Not partially die. It shall die. Death is the consequence of sin, and a partial death doesn't cut it. So, the scripture also says Christ died for us. Again, there's no qualifier. There's no um, part, part, uh, part death. He paid the full penalty. So, we're back to the how. Frankly, it is true that only his humanity died. However, human life would not be enough to atone for the divine broken law. And so, what is also true is that the word of God tells us that he gave up, handed over, surrendered his divine life. He did not retain it. He retained neither his divine life or his human life. And we're told that in scripture. We're about to enter into a study of the Greek language that will provide clarification that the English language doesn't. It will bring clarity out of confusion. So, remember reading earlier, for as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. For that reason alone, because Jesus was given life, he was able to give it back, to return it to the Father from whom it came. Jesus is the only divine being who was given divine life. He was the only son that God begot. And Jesus actually inherited that divine life, and he, it, which needed to be and could be surrendered given up in order to atone for the broken law. So, if Jesus had existed by some divine life force in himself, if he had been inherently divine, and not by any dependence on the Father, then Jesus would not be both God and Son. He would be God only. But, we're told that Christ, the Son of God, died. If he was inherently self-existent, he could no more give up his life than the Father could. So, let's go on to now the Greek. And this truth, is, it makes me excited to tell you about it. It's so glorious, <laughs> and so simple, and so obvious. In the greatest, most heart-melting act of sacrificial love, I can't even get through it. Throughout eternity, Christ on Calvary surrendered his precious life to his Father in God. He loved his Father. And he gave up that relationship so that we could have it. Yes. That is so awesome. He went out of existence so that we could have eternal relationship and companionship in the presence of the Father. He endured a deep, dark hopelessness so that we might never have to endure it. So, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen. Okay, now, yesterday, uh, yesterday we talked about compel. And we know that there were several uh, definitions of compel, there's force, there's make, and there's also urge and persuade. And if you're an honest scholar, you have to choose the definition that fits with the context. You can't just fit the, choose the one that fits with your pre preferred version. You have to fit the one that fits with the context that God has provided you. Uh, also with the term monogenes that we talked about yesterday. You can't just pick 
the definition that you want, you have to pick the one that fits, the one that goes along with the context. Well, we're going to do that with commend. So, earlier, this word commend, um, in some uses, is to speak favorably, like, I might commend you for the quality of the work that you did. And in this verse, God commended. The definition is he showed or declared or made known or proved. There's another definition of commend. But the definition of commend, when Jesus commended his spirit to the Father, is, is used only three times in scripture. And we're going back to that particular commend because in the context of Christ's imminent loss of life, and according to the Greek, from the Strong's numbering, we have this, to deposit as a trust, or for protection, to commit the keeping of. That comes from Accordance Bible software for the Mac computers. And also, this next one comes from this particular Greek lexicon. It means to place with someone for one's own sake to give over in charge, to commit, to entrust. So, it means that while divinity did not die, <clears throat> because divine life cannot die, Jesus did not retain it, he didn't, part of him live on, but he surrendered it into his Father's keeping, to be held in trust until and if the Father so willed to return it to him. And then he died. He literally gave up his life. Ellen White uses that term multiple times. Christ gave up his life. But I didn't even get it, even then, until I found out in the Greek what it meant. He handed it over. Both because humanity did die, yes, but he handed over his divine life. And so, <clears throat> when you look into the Greek that Luke, that Luke used, we see more clearly uh, what was done. And the point being made here, or the obvious point, is that those who deny Jesus' sonship had no explanation, no credible biblical explanation to offer regarding the atonement. And you've already read what they've said. Okay, we've already heard rather what they've said. They have, they personify his divinity and his humanity, and they have this conversation, and his humanity and his divinity agree, okay, yes, your humanity will die, and I'll, I'll go along with it, but I'm not really going to die. Um, and you can say he is good as died, but as good as died, is not dead, you know. And so, um, this shows you that unless we have this understanding, which people don't, you, if you deny his sonship, you have no explanation for the atonement. But there's more evidence. We can't base this on just this one example of the Greek. There's more evidence. So we want, a, you know, we want more than one verse, so we'll go to another one. Here is the last clause in Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said that, he gave up the ghost. Okay? So let's go to the Greek and see what gave up means. Let's get the fullest understanding of these critical words that we can. And gave up in the Greek generally means to give of one's own accord and of goodwill, which means that Jesus freely did give up his own life. But there's further explanation of gave up. It's here on the screen. Gave up means, and this is significant, it is spoken of sacrifice. He gave up the ghost. He's spoken of sacrifice or homage. It was meaning to offer or present. Jesus carried out the Father's will to reconcile man to God by offering his life as a sacrifice for us. He presented it to the Father. Father, I freely give this for their sake to you. 
This is powerful to me. <clears throat> In other words, he made a sacrificial offering uh, to the God whose law it was that was broken. Do you see it? Yes, amen. In, in all the universe, only the begotten Son of God had divine life given to him, and because the Father gave him that divine life, his death on the cross, his ability to die for us, is actually proof that he's the Son of God. Do you see that? Yes. Only he could do this. <laughs> Only he. And this is evidence, again, that he's not inherently self-existent. He's not co-eternal with the Father, as is currently taught. And that has huge significance for Adventist theology, as you can see. And there's more to learn from the Greek. And so we'll go to the next one. Jesus said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. <clears throat> I have power to lay it down, and I have power to lay it up. To take it, take it again, sorry. That made no sense. Power to take it again. Now, on the superficial reading, it sounds like Jesus has something left in himself to take up that life again, which we've already demonstrated. He gave it up. So... How do we explain this? Well, we go to the word power. A marginal note says that power means the right or privilege, but we need to know that that power or authority did not come from Jesus himself, <clears throat> although it may seem to be. The word power, we study here, it means authority, conferred power, delegated empowerment. That's from Bible Hub. And then again from this Greek lexicon, it is permissible, allowed, permission, authorized. You have the right. Everything is of the Father through the Son. Um, this power to lay down his life and take it up again was conferred or delegated by the Father. And even Jesus said as much in Matthew 28, 18. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. So it's, again it sets forth the distinction in the divinity between the Father and the Son. Um, and it can prevent a misunderstanding that Jesus had life in himself uh, in order to um, he had life in himself when he was allegedly dead um, to raise himself. If he wasn't really dead, that, which is a denial of scripture, then if there's no death, how can there be a resurrection? You know, the scripture gets real confused if we think about Jesus retaining his divine life. But Jesus even said, I have power to lay it down. If he laid it down, it is out of his possession. Okay, Jesus also said, I have power, permission, authority to take it again. So here again, we go to Strong's to get the number, and then we go to the lexicon. To receive what is given or imparted, uh, to obtain, to partake of. So the synonyms are to receive deliberately or readily what is offered, to receive gladly, to accept. So he received it, which means he didn't already have it, okay? Um, and then uh, the most likely meaning, obviously, is that he accepted it, um, meaning he was truly dead. And so we're going into more of the Greek. Speaking of the life that Jesus had in himself, we go to this. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power, meaning permission, authority, to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Commandment means to give charge or commission or direction. <clears throat> uh, and again, from the Greek lexicon. In other words, the Father commissioned or authorized his Son to lay down his life and then take it up again. The Father 
is in control. Even his son was subject not only after the end of pl the plan of salvation, but also during it. I do only those things that please him. Um, so Christ did not act independently of the Father, and that is how they accomplish mankind's reconciliation with God. Now, what we know then is Jesus' sonship made the atonement possible because it made the complete, full death possible. And conversely, the atonement itself, because we know we have that atonement, is proof of his sonship. Because only through that life given to him and being given back could we have this. So the sonship proves the atonement, and the atonement proves the sonship. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, the biblically true father-son relationship gives us a profound significance to the act of the father and giving up his son and the act of the son in giving up the life that he loved because it gave him connection with his father. But he gave it up for us. He forfeited it so that we may have it. <clears throat> um, if we say, that the father-son relationship is only a metaphor, we really diminish what happened, we miss the significance of it, our response of love is not called forth, and the death of, the death of Jesus' suffering shows what we have been spared, the cry on the cross, my God, my God, Why have you forsaken me? The cry came because of the separation he experienced from the father he loved and he knew his father loved him. He feared that their separation would be forever. <clears throat> in this place, in this agony of mind, Jesus took our places. He felt the same anguish. Here's this point. Out of love, we have to tell people this information. Here is why toleration or respect to leave people in ignorance of this, in believing a lie or multiple lies, how can we define love by saying toleration or respect when true love is to tell them about the true love of the Father and the Son. This whole evil of toleration and respect and no proselytizing, don't think your religion is any better than anybody else's, just respect where everybody is and leave them in that darkness. That's why toleration cannot be accepted. Because this truth is too beautiful. And it's basically obvious. So, we'll cover some final points now. There's a statement in Ellen Weiss' writings that Christ came forth from the tomb, from the dead, to life that was in himself. Well, it's understood, of course, that there was some amount of life left in that tomb for him to be able to do that, which again means he wasn't really dead, which means we don't have atonement, and the Bible says we do have atonement. So, <clears throat> It's a lack of knowledge of what that word commend means. It means handed over, surrendered. But um, notice also that when she says that he came forth uh, to life in himself, he came forth to life in himself and not by life in himself. Okay? And so, not only that, but there are 25 or 26 verses stating that the Father himself raised him. So how can you fit him coming forth of his own power when the weight of evidence is that the Father raised him? It's at least a 25 to 1 ratio. And so we have to go by the weight of evidence. 
Jesus could not have done that. He had nothing left to give. He gave everything. All that he had, all that he was, he gave up. And that's why understanding what commend means, means so much to us. And now we're going to investigate one other point. I think it's not, no, it's two, sorry. <clears throat> um, let me get to it. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, we've already dealt with that. He's, it sounds like he's got this life in himself, but we, and I don't know of any specific verse or passage that will explain why he says, I will raise it up. But again, we refer to the weight of evidence, but we also have some other evidence in scripture that it wasn't just Jesus, and we know that um, Jesus was given authority or permission to take up the life again, and we know that his life could not come from any other place than the Father, because he took it up again. But we also have this verse. Uh, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now, notice that the angel from heaven rolled back the door. If ever there was a father's invitation to come forth through that now open door, that would be it, okay? It would not have been the case if Jesus had not been uh, an acceptable sacrifice. But he came forth from the life that was returned. He took it back. He takes it again. Uh, he received it or accepted it from his father. And he arose to life that had been returned to him, not by life that he had in himself. Two more quick points. <clears throat> I'm going to give the background first. You know in the last will and testament, that the will and testament does not go into effect until the testator dies. No beneficiary receives anything until the testator passes away. And we learn that in this verse, Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament, that by the means of his death, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also the, of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And so, we learn <coughs> that um, this God-man Jesus had to have been completely died. Otherwise, we would still be waiting for this promise of the internal inheritance. But are we still waiting? No. The Apostle Paul knew that the promise had been fulfilled. The verb Paul uses is the past tense. By his own blood, he, Jesus, entered in once into the holy place, having obtained, past tense, past perfect, um, eternal redemption for us. So it is a done deal. The testator died. We have eternal redemption. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life. And finally, <clears throat> the last point. The Word of God says that Jesus tasted death for everyone. And there's been some confusion about the taste. Did he really die? Did he only partially die? Did he get close to dying but not quite died? I've heard all those versions. And we're going to look into again. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, meaning by God's permission, should taste death for every man. Taste is Strong's. And in Strong's we read, to experience. So even Strong, before we look into the Greek, says that he experienced it. But you notice that F-I-G period. And that means figuratively. Figuratively means it's an imaginative or creative way to state something. So in this case, 
it stated that he experienced death. But they state it in a creative way by saying he tasted it. Um, and likewise, when someone tastes defeat, does that person actually experience defeat so he knows what it's like? Yes. And so Christ experienced or tasted death. He knows what it's like. A standard dictionary, a standard dictionary says to have or get an experience. And these next words are also important, but it also says he got that experience, especially in a slight degree or limited degree. This lexicon says to taste of death, that is to die. When used in this connection, it gives prominence to what is really involved in dying. So Jesus went into that nothingness for three days. There was no Son of God. I, I think about that. I think what heaven must have experienced, what they must have gone through for three days. I think of the people who came to Jerusalem for that Passover. And when they learned, they brought their sick, their dying, their demon-possessed, and they brought them for the mercy of Jesus. And then they learned he was dead. And he was dead for three days. As far as they knew, he was dead permanently. The Greek, diction the, the Greek online dictionary tells us, since death cannot be literally be tasted, meaning with a tongue, the Greek verb taste is here used figuratively with the meaning of to experience something cognitively or emotionally, to come to know something. Okay, and so we know this tells us that Jesus certainly, his tasting death was more than a vicarious experience, more than a superficial experience. It was real. And I'll give you another example. If we get a taste of adventure, we have, we experience adventure, but we only get a taste of it for it's only for a short time. And if we get um, a taste of freedom, we have, we, we experience that freedom, but only for a short time. And so we, when we say a common usage, a taste of freedom, a taste of defeat, whatever, it is to really experience it, but only for a limited time or a slight degree. Mm -hmm. And so again, uh, Jesus didn't continue to experience death because after three days he was resurrected, but it does mean he really did die. And that upholds his sonship, and that upholds the atonement, and that upholds our promise of eternal inheritance. Amen. It all, all of these things, if we look it up in the meaning in the Greek, it all fits together. In conclusion, ah, words are hopelessly inadequate to describe the value of what has been done to us. And words are totally inadequate. I'm a word person, I'm a book person. I do not know how to express my gratitude for what has been done for everybody. Amen. I don't know how to do it. The importance of what you have learned and what you what already knew uh, cannot be overestimated. It was real. It was not metaphorical. It was not figurative. It was not speculative. It was historically, biblically real. It was true. It was documented by multiple trustworthy eyewitnesses, which is the, the highest degree of documentation that you could get, is by eyewitnesses. It was explained in plain language by men inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was written down and shared in apostolic times until the present day. We have concordances, we have lexicons, we have our Bibles to learn more specifically what the Bible says. The Greek confirms for us that Jesus fully and completely died, retaining neither human nor divine life. And unless he done so, had done so, we would have no atonement. Ah, and this means 
that any and all doctrine that deny his true, son, true sonship are false. Mm -hmm. And it means that any and all religions that teach that he's not a true son are false religions. Shall we be tolerant and respectful and say nothing? Or shall we love one another, as Stephen said, enough to share this awesome truth? The devil does not want it known. He's got many different ways to keep us silent through intimidation. Oh, you're intolerant. You're disrespectful. That's hate language. Or simply, oh, can't we just coexist peacefully? Can't you just be tolerant and respectful? I'm sorry. We can lovingly be disrespectful. Okay? Um, the bottom line, in verifiable, documentable fact, Jesus is both God and Son. His divinity qualified him to be the one who alone could make atonement for us. And his divine sonship enabled him to carry it out. It is as straightforward and as profound as that. Amen. So, let us close with prayer. Father, Father, I don't have words, but on behalf of all of us, we are so grateful, Lord, for you and your Son and your Word and your truth and your grace and mercy and justice. And Lord, we, we beg of you that you would transform us into your image so that we could take this beautiful, salvational truth to others. And Father, we're asking that your spirit would strive wherever there is a willing heart. Please, Lord, open minds, open hearts to receive this truth.